Hi, this is Aaron Shafawalaf. Today, I'm going to be talking with Robert Bowman of the Institute for Religious Research. Robert Bowman has recently written an article entitled Understanding Sola Scriptura, the Evangelical View of the Authority of the Bible. Uh, Robert, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You bet. Would you please tell us what is the doctrine of Sola Scriptura? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, perhaps it would be a good to start and explain that the words sola scriptura are Latin, and they mean scripture alone or scripture only. And the those words, of course, scripture alone, suggest that it affirms something unique about scripture. Specifically, uh, and historically, the term has been used uh, to refer to the doctrine that Scripture is the only infallible or unimpeachable rule of faith and practice uh, for Christians. Uh, that is to say that uh, the only uh, source of doctrine, the only source of uh, teaching that Christians have that is uh, infallible and unquestionable uh, is the Bible, is Scripture. And, of course, for us, Scripture means the Bible. So that's basically what it is in a nutshell. And, you know, there are certain misunderstandings that people have about this and certain ideas that they confuse with it that we could tease those out. But that's basically the idea that Scripture alone is the infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians. You keep using this word infallible. Maybe some of our listeners don't know what that means. How is the doctrine of sola scriptura distinct from other doctrines concerning scripture, like the sufficiency of scripture, or like you said, the infallibility of scripture? Right. Well, uh, the idea that scripture is infallible means that it never fails to teach the truth, uh, that it is uh, something that does not have as a, a problem uh, things in it that might not be true that have to be sorted out or, or pulled out from what is true. But rather, all of Scripture is understood to be uh, without any kind of failing in its doctrine. Now, a related or very similar concept, overlapping concept, uh, is the inerrancy of Scripture, which is the idea that Scripture is without error. That's perhaps a more uh, comprehensive uh, way of putting it because it's affirming that Scripture is without error in anything that it uh, says or anything that it presents as truth, uh, whereas infallibility is commonly understood to be really focused on doctrine or teaching. But th th there's, that's a very fine line between those two concepts. So for our purposes, uh, we can even treat them as synonymous. Uh, the basic idea is that Scripture is this source of teaching, this source of doctrine that we can see and, and look at, and of course we can even touch it, uh, that is uh, infallible, and that this is something unique about Scripture in Contra in contrast to any other uh, sources of doctrine that we might look at, such as creeds, uh, doctrinal statements of a denomination, uh, popular Christian books by respected authors or <laughs> even disrespected authors, uh, religious leaders in the church, the pope, uh, bishops, your favorite pastor, your favorite televangelist, uh, good or bad, uh, the doctrine of sola scriptura maintains that as good as some of these sources may be, uh, they are not infallible, uh, scripture is, and so it has this unique uh, character that gives it final authority in doctrinal controversies within the church. Robert, is this the same thing as saying that the canon uh, of recognized scripture is closed? Uh, no, it's not the same thing at all. Uh, now, of course, evangelical 
Protestant Christians believe in both of these ideas. They believe in sola scriptura, and they believe that the canon of scripture is closed. Uh, but these are two different ideas. Uh, hypothetically, uh, the canon of scripture might be open, and any new book that came along that was uh, to be incorporated into the canon would then uh, be part of this infallible rule of faith and practice that we call scripture. Uh, so hypothetically, you could believe in sola scriptura and not in the closure of the canon. I suppose you could, uh, in fact, I know you can do the reverse as well. There are many Christians who believe that the canon of scripture is closed, but don't believe in sola scriptura. Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox Christians, they affirm that the canon is closed, but they don't affirm sola scriptura. Uh, so these are two distinct ideas. Uh, one does not necessarily imply the other, although in the case of evangelical Protestants like me, uh, we believe both of those things. Robert, uh, you say in your article, Scripture is the only written Word of God available to us today. That seemed to be a quick way of summarizing sola scriptura uh, beyond the original definition you gave. And that quote, the only written, that the Bible is the only written word of God in the church's possession. Uh, what is so special about having the written form of God's word? And what about that makes it um, different from, say, something that's like a natural revelation? Uh, that's a term we might use. General revelation, for example, in nature, where God speaks, uh, he communicates his attributes in a nonverbal way through the visible creation. Right. Well, First of all, <coughs> we should explain why it's important to refer to Scripture as the only uh, written or verbal word of God that's accessible to the church. The reason why I make that qualification is because it is not the claim of the doctrine of sola scriptura that Scripture alone is the word of God, that there has never been any word of God ever spoken uh, except what is in Scripture. Uh, Jesus said many things that are not recorded in the Gospels. Anything that Jesus said, by definition, <laughs> at least in my Christology, would be the Word of God. So uh, that doesn't mean uh, that Scripture, uh, so Scripture doesn't contain everything that God has ever said or that Christ has ever said, uh, but what it does contain it is unique in comparison to any other verbal source of doctrine or uh, information that we might have in that scripture is inspired by God and is infallible in its revelation of God's truth and God's will. So uh, let's say, for example, uh, let's talk about the fact that there are certain books and, or other documents mentioned in the Bible uh, that we don't have today. Uh, perhaps most famously, it appears that Paul wrote three or four letters, probably four letters, to the church at Corinth, and we only have two. Uh, is it possible that uh, Third Corinthians, if you want to use that term, uh, could have been inspired uh, just the same as what we call First and Second Corinthians? Uh, sure, uh, but it doesn't exist now. It's not extant. And it never became part of the canon. It's not something that was in the canon and then taken out. <laughs> it's just never been available uh, to the church at large. It's never been uh, publicly accessible outside of the immediate circumstances in which it was sent to the church at Corinth. And so uh, it's not part of the scripture. Uh, and since it's not part of scripture and can't be part of scripture because it doesn't exist in any accessible form, uh, it, uh, it can't function in that way, but it could very well have been an inspired document uh, that would have been, you know, God speaking through the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth at that particular point in time. So, uh, Sola Scriptura does not require us to believe that everything that God has ever communicated to human beings anywhere in the world, any time in history, 
has all been preserved in the canon of Scripture. We don't make that claim. What we say is what we have in Scripture is uniquely the written Word of God accessible to us today, something that we can actually touch and look at and read and hear and, and, and understand and, and talk about, and it's available to us as the Word of God, and nothing else has the character or the quality uh, required to function as an authority uh, above and beyond or uh, it preeminent over what we have in the Word of God in Scripture. You say in the article, quote, while the apostles were still alive, they expected Christians to treat their oral teaching as equally authoritative to their written teaching. Can you explain that? Well, the, the apostles would go into a church uh, or they would found a church and, and teach the people in that church and they would teach them orally, uh, out loud, uh, and they wouldn't simply communicate with them in writing. And what they were saying to them uh, was God speaking through them. They were authorized to speak for God uh, in those circumstances. And Paul makes reference to this uh, in a few places in his epistles. So uh, when they were doing that, and a, an example would be 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where Paul says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. That's First Thessalonians, uh, Second Thessalonians two fifteen. Uh, now, many critics of the doctrine of sola scriptura say, "Aha! See, it's not just the written word, not just the letter. It's also the spoken word uh, that is authoritative, equally alongside the written word." Well, sure, when it's available to you, but it's no longer accessible. We don't have. Uh, tape recordings or digital recordings or podcasts uh, with the Apostle Paul where we can listen to him uh, and deliver the spoken word and we can compare that with his letters and uh, put it right alongside. It's not accessible. The only accessible form of the uh, word of God spoken through the apostles is what we find in the New Testament canon. It's in the books. It's in the writings. Now, if we had uh, apostles today, living apostles of the same kind as Paul and John and James and so forth, uh, that had the same authority, then everything that they taught would also be the word of God. Uh, but we don't. Uh, and for example, I, I don't accept the claims of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that their leaders are apostles and even a prophet. Uh, I don't if I may add, that. it seems as though LDS people in practice, while they think that they uphold their own leaders as uh, apostles and prophets, much like uh, Paul and Peter, that in practice they actually don't treat them with the same amount of authority uh, as Paul and Peter had, for example, they, the amount of expecta uh, high, heightened expectation of reliability that we take from the 11 apostles, the 12 apostles of the New Testament, uh, is not something that... It, religions that seem to reject sola scriptura seem to have a hard time treating any source as infallible uh, and inerrant. Well, this is true. I'm, not only will they uh, very often... Uh, deny believing in the infallibility uh, of what these uh, various uh, teachers uh, have said, uh, they will claim they didn't speak for the church when they said it, uh, <laughs> even when they clearly were. Uh, so that's very difficult to understand uh, from a biblical perspective. When the apostles spoke, their spoken word was just as authoritative as their letters. And if the New Testament apostles uh, had that kind of authority in their uh, oral speech, then you would expect uh, the, the LDS apostles to, to do so as well. But uh, even Mormons, generally speaking, don't uh, take that viewpoint. The same thing applies to certain uh, hyper uh, Pentecostal or extreme charismatic figures that are recognized by some groups as apostles and prophets, certainly not by all charismatics and Pentecostals. 
But these extreme groups have their leaders that they often call apostles and prophets uh, and compare with the apostles and prophets of the New Testament in some cases. And yet uh, they don't, uh, they're not regarded as speaking with the same authority as the biblical prophets and apostles. So it, that is a bit confusing. I, I would just say this, that uh, just to make this clear to people that are, are, are trying to follow what we're saying here, when the apostles in the New Testament spoke at various churches or when they preached the gospel, they were speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ with his authority, and what they said was his truth. And then they wrote it down before they died so that we would have a permanent deposit or a permanent uh, record preserved of their doctrine so that we would know what it was that they taught after they were gone. That's probably the main reason why they uh, wrote things other than the immediate circumstances of, oh, I'm going to write a letter to this church because they're misbehaving or they're not understanding something. Uh, the Gospels were written, for example, to make sure that people knew what uh, Jesus said even after the eyewitnesses were gone. So uh, we have a real uh, blessing in the fact that we have the New Testament writings that preserve what Jesus and the apostles taught and that has an authority that takes precedence over anything that anybody else might teach today. And that's what sola scriptura really means. Rob, in your article you say, quote, apostles and uh, you speak of apostles, quote, in their unique, unrepeatable role as the first generation founding members and witnesses of the church. One of the things that uh, was of great interest to me in your article is that at, as uh, Paul and Peter uh, have a sense of their ministry coming to an end, they don't tell their listeners uh, or their readers to look to other um, successors. Instead, they, ha they are pointing their audience to the written word of God. Can you speak to that, please? Yes, this is a very important point. Uh, in Second Peter, in Jude, uh, both of these documents written toward the end of the New Testament era, uh, Peter's, uh, as he is getting close to his martyrdom, uh, they tell their readers uh, to maintain the faith by remembering what the apostles and prophets taught, past tense, not by remaining faithful and obedient to what future apostles and prophets might teach. There's never anything said about an intention even to have such leaders perpetuated beyond the first generation. The, the key book of the New Testament here, besides those passing references in, in 2 Peter and Jude, the key book here really is Ephesians. Because Ephesians, uh, one of the things that Paul does is in Ephesians is he lays out an understanding of the unique role of the apostles and prophets of the first century church. And by the way, you've heard me use that expression a few times now. Paul in Ephesians 2.20, 3.5, and 4.11, three times in that epistle, refers to the apostles and prophets. Now, this isn't in this context, the apostles of the New Testament and the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, this is the apostles and prophets of the first generation of the church. We know that there were these two distinct groups, maybe overlapping groups in the first century because we have references to both apostles and prophets in the book of Acts. And they appear to be two distinct groups. So what Paul is saying is, that Christ established the church with leadership uh, in the form of these two offices, the apostles and prophets, and that they were to serve as the foundational offices. He calls them the foundation in Ephesians 2.20. They were to serve as the foundation of the church. Now, this does not mean that they had to be living in each generation in order to be the foundation, but rather 
uh, like a foundation that is laid once and then you build on it, Christ laid the foundation of the church in the apostles and prophets and in their teaching and evangelistic ministry in the first century, in the first generation of Christian uh, of Christianity, and then he has been building on that foundation uh, in the expansion of the gospel and the expansion of the church ever since. So Ephesians, and again those references are Ephesians 2.20, 3, 5, and 4, 11. Paul treats these two offices as different from ministries like pastors and teachers or elders or deacons which are ongoing local congregational ministries. The apostles and prophets are these foundational ministries that existed in the first century and that passed away without anyone ever expressing any uh, dismay at the fact that they were passing away. Uh, Peter and Jude, as I mentioned earlier, does not say, uh, you know, make sure you listen to your apostles and prophets, uh, you know, going forward. Nor does he say, it's too bad we're not going to have any. He just says, remember what the apostles and prophets taught. If I may Stick quote you again, that. you said that the apostles had a, quote, unique and unrepeatable role as first generation founding members and witnesses of the church. And in your article, you say that in Second Timothy, pas uh, chapter 2, verse 2, um, Paul passed on his teachings to faithful men who were able to to teach others also, that, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2 reads, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You also write in 2 Peter, the apostle Peter recognizes that his life is coming to an end and that the church is going to be assaulted by false teachers. His instruction for standing firm against such teachers is to quote, you're quoting Peter, remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets, previously spoken, that's my emphasis, of the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles. The true faith will be maintained not by submitting without question to the bishops or creeds, but by remembering what God said, past tense, in the past through the prophets and the apostles of Christ. Uh, that is an interesting uh, observation, too, that in Ephesians, uh, the Apostles and prophets are presented somewhat differently than the pastors and evangelists that are later added to that list. Also, it's interesting that um, it's not the prophet and apostles, it's the apostles and prophets. Yes, whereas in 2 Peter 3, 2, uh, the order is reversed. It's the holy prophets, which refers to the Old Testament prophets, and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles, and that's New Testament. So uh, the term prophets can be used in the New Testament in different contexts, sometimes referring to what we would call the Old Testament prophets, other times referring to New Testament figures, New Testament leaders that were distinguished from the apostles, like Agabus, who's a prophet mentioned in the book of Acts. So uh, in either case, uh, all of these passages refer to these figures as uh, men who, whose teaching is foundational for the church that are to be upheld, remembered, retained, and passed on to future generations as the basis for Christian doctrine. And that's, of course, what uh, Christianity did. They did not uh, keep producing uh, new prophets and apostles. They did not add new texts to the canon of Scripture and have it keep growing and growing, uh, nor did they think that they had lost something they were supposed to have by not having living apostles or prophets, uh, but that this was what God had intended to do. Now, I, I maybe if you don't mind, I'll just mention here that sure. uh, Mormons are in something of a quandary with this uh, historical question in mind of why wasn't the ministry of apostles perpetuated beyond the first century? Uh, there certainly was not a sustained enough effort to squash Christianity or persecute it uh, that it would explain why they weren't able to have more apostles appointed. They certainly could have continued the office if they wanted now, to. Now, when I've asked LDS people about why if it was so important, they didn't appoint uh, subsequent 
apostles beyond themselves. Uh, yeah. The most significant answer I've received is that there was a logistics problem of both persecution and evil in the church. Uh, that God literally just had a logistics problem getting the, the <laughs> quorum together uh, to appoint new apostles. And it also seems curious to me that um, given the new covenant promises to for God to gather his people um, and given the parables of Jesus to grow his kingdom, even among uh, even wheat among tares, uh, it, it seems completely inappropriate to think of Jesus as someone who is not able to keep his church alive and real and enduring and his word preserved and it makes joseph smith's boasting at the end of his life that he was able to do a work that jesus had not been able to do namely to keep the church together um especially arrogant but uh, let me at, let me ask you a question um robert you say in the article that the doctrine has a basis uh, it has a meaning, and you also want to talk about the significance of sola scriptura. So let's let's say that someone's in a local church, and uh, what what's, what practical impact does this have for them as they live the life of a Christian in the local church? Well, it provides a basis for Christians uh, to know uh, where we're supposed to look for our answers to difficult questions about. God and our relationship with him, uh, it, it clarifies the discussion once it is understood that scripture has this unique character and uh, unique authority. Uh, it provides, and it, it provides an objective basis for talking about our differences, talking about our questions, if we don't have something objective like a text that we can look at together and say, yep, that's what it says, <laughs> uh, then uh, your opinion may be one thing and my opinion may be something else. And all we have is our own kind of uh, best guess as to what it is that we're going to believe. Well, that's not going to work very well. Uh, Robert, what, so, what, what kind yeah. of... What kind of instructions or even commands or presses are local pastors of a church authorized by God to give? Let's, let me throw some things out there. I, you know, I, it seems obvious that what Scripture explicitly says is something that we ought to preach uh, and press into the conscience of people we love in our congregations. But uh, let's say there's something that seems to be a pretty clear implication or a kind of practical outworking. Uh, say you have a man in a marriage who uh, ought to love his wife, as scripture says, but uh, scripture doesn't outline the amount of uh, time he should spend with her, talking to her, uh, <laughs> the, 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 kind of the practicality of that. And uh, right. let me throw one more scenario out. Let's say that a pastor says that in order to be a, uh, a, a, a Christian and good standing, that this person has to refrain from certain kinds of foods or drinks. Uh, how does this doctrine speak to that? Well, uh, first of all, it's the New Testament tells us very plainly uh, that we are uh, not to submit to man-made rules that are sort of arbitrarily uh, set up by religious leaders on the basis of their own authority rather than on the basis of the Word of God. Uh, we are not to uh, give credence to these kinds of uh, uh, demands. Now, you know, there are issues where people have legitimate differences of opinion or where people have, uh, you know, the, the practical working out of the implications of Christian values. And what that looks like in a particular culture might vary uh, depending on you know uh, what century you're living in and, and all the rest of it. Okay, fine. But what you do then is you, you have a, a, a church that meets at together and talks the issue through and looks at what Scripture says as the standard by which we're going to try to make uh, any decisions in this matter, and it's not necessarily going to give us uh, specific answers to every possible question, but it's going to give us a framework 
and a way of thinking about these things that will give us guidance in making wise decisions. This is uh, quite the responsibility of, for believers, too, because we're given quite the freedom to and responsibility to test what our leaders are teaching us. Yes. Um, and we aren't given the minutia necessarily. Um, it's not as though we have uh, f- infallible local pastors that can uh, micromanage all of our life and tell us exactly what to do. Um, it, it's rather that they can preach the word and give us that framework. But that's an incredible responsibility. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I uh, train wrecked any line of thought you had. No, uh, you're fine. Yeah, I, go go for it. Well, a- absolutely. Uh, but when we have statements in, for example, in Colossians chapter 2, where Paul tells the Colossians uh, not to submit to uh, taboos that are part of a man-made attempt to sound religious and pious, but uh, really aren't about uh, anything of... of uh, they have no power value. in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Right. They're, it's not really going to make you a holy person, but uh, we're going to just say, okay, uh, don't eat this food and don't drink that drink and you know, don't do this and don't touch that. Uh, where you don't have any biblical teaching that says... That's how you're supposed to live. Paul says, don't, don't fall for that. Don't, don't fall into that trap. So if you have a pastor that's trying, or a group of uh, elders or whatever that are trying to push a particular agenda that clearly violates the spirit of what Paul says there, then the congregation uh, is you know, supposed to say, hey, uh, where is that in the Bible? <laughs> you know, uh, What's the basis for this? Now, you know, I can understand uh, churches saying we have to have some kind of policy on this particular matter. We don't have it spelled out black and white in Scripture. Uh, here's here's how we're proposing to do this. Uh, if you don't find this to your taste, that's okay. We're not saying you're not a Christian or something, but we've got to come up with some kind of a, a practical you know, outworking, an agreed upon framework. Okay, that's different. But when it when you have people preaching. This is the word of God. You have to do it this way. If you don't, uh, you're you're not welcome here. You're not a believer, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of thing, uh, then uh, that's a violation of uh, of that teaching there in Colossians two. And that's just one example that may be a simple example, but it applies across the board. So, uh, you know, there are there are people that uh, they try to build their whole ministries on. I've got this great idea nobody else has, and if you don't accept it, you're not listening to God today. That's not a sound foundation for for a Christian ministry. Robert, um, you might hear the argument, I know you have, uh, that Scripture itself does not spell out the doctrine of sola scriptura in a straightforward, you know, explicit way. Uh, Scripture doesn't say that only Scripture is the infallible and, and binding rule for faith and practice. So uh, what would you say to someone who says that the nature of Scripture itself doesn't seem to adequately imply this doctrine? Well, what I would say is uh, the words sola scriptura in any language, of course, are not found explicitly in the Bible. But the basis for the doctrine clearly is there because Scripture, uh, the books of Scripture testify to the idea that scripture is the word of God, written uh, word of God, that uh, we are not to regard the pronouncements of religious leaders who do not speak as prophets or apostles as comparable to or equivalent in authority to scripture. Uh, We find warnings about human traditions that violate scripture. Jesus himself warned about that in the gospels. Uh, so, you know, you just go down the line. What, what is it that you think <laughs> uh, is equivalent in authority to Scripture, according to Jesus or the apostles, uh, that we are supposed to put alongside it as equal in authority? I, I can't find anything. And so, uh, in, in practice... Uh, we have to distinguish two different directions from which we get these kinds of objections. First of all, uh, Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians both 
reject the doctrine of sola scriptura, at least on paper. But when you start asking some hard questions, well, do you have any infallible authority that it comes in a verbal form where I can hear or read it and I can know what it is and I can know what it is I'm supposed to believe besides the Bible? What do you have? Well, Eastern Orthodox Christians basically have nothing. Uh, and uh, they sort of have the So creeds, the rejection of Sola Scriptura ends up kind of being... Uh, Empty, like deflated. It's vacuous. It's yes, and and in the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, there are a couple of papal pronouncements that are regarded as infallible, but it, it's almost nothing. Uh, so, uh, in in actual uh, in the sort of fine details of the doctrines of revelation and scripture and authority in both of those communions. It is recognized that Scripture has a unique authority uh, that nothing else really compares to. And so you can, you can help them understand what it is Protestants are saying by pointing this out. And there are sources that you could point to within those traditions that acknowledge that Scripture is the Word of God and that the words of popes and, and you know, councils and so forth aren't. The other direction from which we get this kind of objection, typically, are groups like Mormonism. Uh, but the Mormons uh, are advocating a rejection of, they're rejecting sola scriptura uh, for two reasons. One, as you brought up at, toward the beginning of our conversation, they tend to confuse it with the closure of the canon. And secondly, they reject sola scriptura because they very often and I have to say it that way because there's no unanimity in talking to Mormons about these things, but they very often, if not typically, accord equal authority to the current pronouncements of their prophets and apostles as to the written words of Scripture. I heard uh, it so said... Uh, when they do that, uh, when they, do that uh, they, they obviously cannot abide by sola scriptura. I know there's different LDS attitudes on this. One phrase that I found helpful is uh, prima ecclesia. In other words, to treat the church as the primary authority over and against scripture at times if necessary. Um, and in the, the Mormon version of that, uh, that sort of the last six months of conference reports are treated as uh, scripture that is, that is in practice uh, the unifying authoritative teaching of the church that is of even more authority than written scripture. It does seem like um, there's a lot of disagreement among Mormons about whether they should filter scripture by the words of modern prophets or filter the words of modern prophets by that of scripture. Uh, there's different leanings. Some Mormons at BYU even seem to kind of lean toward a prima scriptura, uh, where the only, uh, or even a so kind of lean toward a sola scriptura and accidentally by saying that the only binding official doctrine that we have is in the standard works, but even that gets limited to something uh, uh, to be a subset of that. Whereas the mainstream or the street Mormonism that I'm, I typically encounter is uh, that of LDS people saying that we, because of the uh, lack of, uh, I'll put it this way, because of the lack of the reliability and because of the corruption of scripture, uh, because of the nature of inspiration, namely that old words are more like dead words and we need living prophets because of their view of inspiration uh, that they, they say, well, we really need living prophets to be the best sort of uh, authority available to us. Yes, it's a very different way of looking at it than what you're getting, say, from an Eastern Orthodox Christian. I, I would argue that the real uh, dividing line between evangelicals here in Utah, where I'm at, and the Mormon faith, uh, sola scriptura, as regards scripture, probably isn't where the watershed of disagreement is. I would argue that the, the nature of inspiration and <laughs> of scripture itself <laughs> and prophetic reliability itself is the kind of the deeper issue. Uh, w when, when God ensures Samuel as a prophet, it says that he, he did not let any of his words fall to the ground. So evangelicals have an extremely high view of prophets and apostles and in order to uh, see scripture in the LDS framework, one has to uh, dramatically plummet their view of, of the reliability of prophets in scripture. Well, you know, just speaking frankly here, I, I think 
a major reason why that has been necessary is that the doctrines taught in the LDS scriptures, the specifically Latter-day scriptures of the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, uh, are not consistent with one another. They represented Joseph Smith's own rapidly changing theologies between 1829 and 1844, and he started off as a monotheist and ended up as a polytheist, and it took the church almost uh, 75 years before they figured out how to come up with a synthesis that at least on paper looked like it harmonized all of these disparate elements in Joseph's teaching. But the fallout of that is that it can never for Mormons be as simple as Scripture says. Because what Scripture says has to be interpreted according to uh, a kind of uh, higher court of appeal, which is the church's present teaching, whatever that might be. And so if the church today says, this is what we believe, what Scripture says has to be accommodated to that rather than the other way around. So although I know that there are professors at BYU that argue the other direction, as you mentioned, I think the church authorities themselves have encouraged this idea, and the rank and file, for the most part, have adopted this idea. And to, that to summarize whatever that, whatever scriptures oh, say has to be accommodated to what the leaders say today, rather than the other way around. Yeah, sorry for over speaking. There's this remote no, no problem. Uh, podcast thing. I can't see each other's body language. Uh, so to, <laughs> to summarize uh, your point, I think it, there's LDS people who lean toward prima ecclesia, maybe that the church is authoritative over scripture and that we should use leaders to interpret scripture. But there's another end that where people lean toward prima scriptura, perhaps using scripture to test and filter and correct what their own leaders are saying. But it gets really tricky uh, for that latter group when they are told that scripture itself is to be authoritatively interpreted by the leaders. If we could jump out of uh, Utah here for a second sure. to progressive uh what people call progressive Christianity anyway, uh, with people who are adopting cultural uh, ideas about sexuality and uh, the church. And there's a popular argument that Jesus is the word, and therefore we ought not elevate scripture to be the final and infallible written expression of God's word. Uh, what would you say to that? Well, I I'd say it's a category mistake because uh, Jesus Christ is referred to in the Bible as the Word of God, as the Word who was in the beginning uh, with God and who was God, John chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, and so, yes, Jesus is called the Word of God. Uh, but we know that because the Bible tells us that. <laughs> and, in fact, there's no conflict uh, between Jesus as the living, personal Word and scripture as the verbal written word of God. So these are two different uses of the term word, and they're not in conflict. And in fact, I would argue that if we're going to draw a comparison between scripture as the word of God and Jesus as the word of God, it should go something like this. Jesus, as the living word of God, spoke absolute truth from God. You could depend on everything that Jesus said to be true. Likewise, if Scripture is the Word of God, you can absolutely depend on what it says to be what God wants you to know. So uh, comparing the incarnate Word uh, with the inscripturated Word, one would expect that Scripture would be totally reliable and true, just as Jesus was and is totally reliable and true. So I think the argument backfires. I can't imagine saying to my wife, uh, honey, I trust you, but I don't trust what you say. Or I trust you, but I don't trust what you've written. Uh, it, it's hard to divorce God's words from him. <laughs> so, any, Rob, any final words uh, or thoughts on this whole topic of Sola Scriptura? Well, I, I think that people need to understand that Sola Scriptura is not to be confused with a kind of uh, naive biblicism and 
I, I think the term naive, the adjective naive is helpful here. Uh, by naive biblicism, I mean the idea that the Bible is the only source of truth, that you can't find any truth outside the Bible. Uh, if it's not in the Bible, it's not true. No, that's not sola scriptura. Uh, there's lots of truth that we learn from the world around us through the sciences, through history, uh, through our own experiences, through the five senses, and that's truth. And that truth uh, isn't in competition with the truth of Scripture. It complements or supplements what we have in Scripture. It does not compete with it. So when we say that, uh, when we talk about sola scriptura or Scripture only being the Word of God, uh, we are not denying that we can learn truth from other sources. So this would be the distinction between uh, a, a kind of a historic evangelicalism, uh, such as is really rooted in the teachings of the uh, reformers, uh, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and so forth. Uh, that kind of evangelical Protestant, Protestant theology, which didn't have a problem quoting Augustine, for example, to back up uh, what they were saying as, as you know, something that had been around in church history for a long time and not something that the reformers were making up. Uh, they didn't have a problem doing that. They didn't have a problem with science. They didn't have a problem with history. They had a problem only with the kinds of philosophy that were being developed in competition with the scriptures as a source of truth that might correct or trump the uh, word of God in scripture. Uh, so you can compare that kind of historic evangelicalism, which teaches sola scriptura, with a kind of naive extreme fundamentalism, which says, if it's not in the King James Version of the Bible, I don't believe it. You know, uh, <laughs> this, this kind of mindset uh, and is instantly suspicious of science or history uh, as, as valid sources of truth. We don't have to be afraid of truth wherever it may come from. We don't have to be afraid of learning something outside the Bible. What we have to understand, though, is that the Bible has a unique place in a Christian's understanding of the world because it provides a worldview, it provides God's story of what he's been doing in the world and what he's going to do and how he wants us to live and all those kinds of things. In light of which, we do good science, good history, uh, in light of which we learn as much as we can about the world and understand it in a way that honors the truth about God. So that's a very important distinction. I think many people especially uh, in the secular, uh, skeptical uh, part of our culture, hear sola scriptura as a kind of obscurantism, that we don't believe anything if it's not found in the Bible. That is simply not the case. That's not sola scriptura at all. Thank you, Robert. You've been listening to Aaron Shafawalaf. I'm with Mormonism Research Ministry, and you've been listening to Robert Bowman, who is with the Institute for Religious Research, if you would like to read the article that Robert wrote on Sola Scriptura, you can go to irr.org, irr.org, and click Biblical Christianity, then click Bible General Studies, and then you'll see under Authority, Understanding Sola Scriptura, the Evangelical View of the Authority of the Bible.